Thank you very much, Colleen. It's my pleasure to be here with you this morning and to uh, uh, share some thoughts on situational awareness. Uh, the uh, title of this morning's webinar is Situational Awareness, the Essence of Risk Management. It's the same title as, the, uh, as an article uh, that I wrote um, in the uh, Ermia Journal. It was published uh, last uh, August. And we will be happy to share a copy of that article with you as well if you're interested in, uh, uh, in reading the full text. The uh, discussion this morning is designed to help us understand what situational awareness is. We will discuss it from a, uh, from a uh, theoretical standpoint and then uh, we'll look at it from, uh, from a practical standpoint as well. I will share uh, some uh, specific stories about situational awareness. Uh, in cases, uh, in most cases, they will be examples where there was a certain lack of situational awareness, and um, and uh, uh, there were some negative consequences as a result. That's not designed to um, discomfort anyone, but it's really designed to help us learn because sometimes. Sometimes those are the best uh, kinds of examples for, uh, for the learning process. Uh, before I go into the, oh, and I also should mention that I will do a number of case studies as part of this presentation. Uh, case studies that we've dealt with at the City University of New York. And, uh, and, and I'll be happy to share uh, the background on those and of course some of the results. Uh, before we go any further, I think we need to define our terms, and I have an unusual way of uh, introducing the definition of, um, of situational awareness, and I'm going to show you uh, the next slide and pause for a moment for you to digest it. I don't know how many of you are Gary Larson Farside fans. Um, I, I find some of uh, uh, some of his uh, dark humor to be a little disconcerting. It probably is as well, but uh, but it certainly gives us a sense of what can happen when situational awareness is absent from a um, from a, from from uh, an event. Uh, so I'm going to start by telling you a story about situational awareness. And it's a story that uh, I and um, tens of thousands of New Yorkers were involved in on a very sad day in New York history. And the, uh, the story of the situational awareness uh, episode, of course, takes place on 9-11-2001, and it takes place in the World Trade Center itself. Some of you might uh, notice in the pictures below, you might remember these three scenes. The first one is uh, is a path a path train at the very um, bottom of the uh, World Trade Center. It's the path station, and we all got off that path train that morning. And there was an officer standing there, and he was telling us to get off the platform. And he had no idea why he was telling us to get off the platform. He knew that there was a report of some smoke in the tunnel. And uh, if, you're, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, if you frequent the path or the New York City subway system, you know that there's occasionally some smoke in a tunnel. It doesn't really make much of a difference uh, to most people. They kind of ignore it and go about their way. But this officer was telling us to get off the platform. Now, I guess they, he didn't have to convince us much because we were there for going to work. So we were planning to get off the platform anyway. We went up that escalator on the second picture. <laughs> of course, that one doesn't exist anymore either. We went up that big, tall escalator. Some of you remember this, going up to the main concourse. When we got to the top, we saw other officers also who had very little uh, understanding of what was going on other than that there was some smoke coming out of the lobby of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And they really had no sense of situational awareness other than that they were hearing on the radio to get people moving and, and stay away from that area. And the people themselves, myself included, 
were completely unaware. You could see this picture all the way on the right where we were just stopping off to get our uh, morning coffee and bagel and whatever else we were going to get on our way to work and <laughs> completely ignoring what was going on. There was a total lack of situational awareness until we got outside and all of us left the station, left the building, and we looked up. And we looked up to that uh, picture on the lower left, and we saw that one of the World Trade Towers was on fire and there was smoke coming out of it. And we looked up, none of us had heard the news. None of us, if we had heard the news, would have known what, what was really happening because nobody knew what was happening. Um, it, the assumption was that there was an accident or an explosion or a plane accidentally ran into the, into the building. In any case, we're all looking up at this, at this burning skyscraper. And it's not something that New Yorkers typically do. In fact, it's a badge of honor that we don't look up at the tall buildings. It's something only the tourists do when they come to New York. But we were doing it, we were doing it because it's mesmerizing to see a burning building like this. And we were standing there and we had no idea. There were 10,000 people standing on the street just staring because it was just at the end of rush hour. We we're all on our way to work. And we were standing in that park over there that you see in the, many of you recognize it if you're from the area. It's now known as Zuccotti Park. It was where the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement uh, had its headquarters. But back then it was just a park next to the World Trade Center. And you see the you see what happened uh, uh, to, to that park during this uh, fateful day. In any case, we're all looking up there. We have no idea what's going on. And then all of a sudden, somewhere out of the back of my consciousness, I hear a fire engine air horn. And it's high. I don't, I don't know. I must have been going. It must have been honking for a few seconds. But I didn't. It just didn't enter my consciousness until I finally realized that it was right on top of me and trying to get through. And that was the first time that my situational awareness started to rise from total ignorance or lack of awareness to the notion that there's a problem here. And I was, uh, my reaction was, was positive because I said to myself that if I'm not part of the solution, I'm part of the problem and I better get out of the way. And so I did. And so I headed to my office because there was this terrible accident at the World Trade Center, and I wanted to make sure that all of my employees were um, were safe, and that uh, and 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 we would figure out what uh, what actually happened and what to do next. So I'm walking down Broadway, and you could see it in the uh, you could see the building. It was 111 Broadway. It's etched in my memory because I was walking right past it when the second plane hit the second building. And at that point, my situational awareness and everyone else's went into overdrive. There was no longer any doubt what happened. There was no longer uh, any question as to what was going on. And we all knew that we had to go figure out what to do next. But situational awareness is something that we were completely lacking at the outset. And I'm guessing that because of that, uh, there were a lot of people who stayed in that area. A lot of people who might have been hurt who could have otherwise gotten farther away from the, uh, from the incident and perhaps not have, um, not have been impact as impacted as dramatically by it. So let's get away from, from this dramatic case and talk about situational awareness in a way that's much more uh, relevant and common to us in our everyday lives. Most of the discussions you'll hear about situational awareness are focused on these dramatic events, violent, potentially violent criminal events, uh, active shooter, terrorism, other mass casualty incidents. But the truth is that most of the bad things that happen to us happen to us because we have a lack of situational awareness for other hazards uh, that are much more common. They are sometimes violent, sometimes nonviolent. They're sometimes dramatic and sometimes very routine. And the reason that I wrote this article 
is because I have to thank FEMA for doing it, because FEMA's Office of Academic Engagement, which we track very, uh, very uh, closely at uh, CUNY and I'm sure at every other, every risk manager at every university uh, pays close attention to these kinds of releases. Well, FEMA came out with the Campus Resilience Program Resource Library. I recommend all of you who are involved in risk management to access it, whether you're in academia or not. I think it's a very, very valuable tool. Um, as uh, I'll just quote, the library aims to provide members of the academic community with access to resources, strategies, guidelines, and templates to address a variety of different vulnerabilities and risks. It organizes resources according to specific threats and or hazards, and then further categorizes each resource according to its relevant mission area as outlined in the FEMA National Preparedness Goal. Now, I, I, as you can see, and I apologize for this, uh, I, um, the uh, text in this uh, presentation comes straight from the article. Uh, we will share the, uh, the uh, presentation with you as well as a uh, copy, a full copy of the article. But I, I kept it here because I like using, I won't read it to you, of course, but I like a quoting from some of the, uh, some of the documents that were referenced in the uh, article because I think it, um, it, brings them, uh, it brings them into fuller uh, relief. In any case, uh, they have they have issues, they have uh, modules on workplace violence, explosions, dirty bombs, everything that you would normally expect them to have, but they also have the more mundane issues. You see the logo for one of the modules, it's on the right, and it, focus on, it focuses on uh, natural disasters and weather and uh, the normal things that affect us. It's going to snow in the New York area today. Um, hopefully it won't be too severe, but if there was a more serious snowstorm or more serious uh, uh, freezing weather, as we're seeing in the in the Midwest, um, fires break out in our in our buildings on a regular basis. If especially if we're not uh, uh, attuned to fire safety practices, hurricanes, tornadoes, those are the kinds of things that we also have to be thinking about on a regular basis and developing tools to make sure that we minimize the impact of those risks. But before we can minimize the impact, we have to be aware of what's going on. Situational awareness should be seen as an all hazards tool. The logo that you see on the uh, upper right hand corner is from the, uh, is, is from the FEMA document. And it's one of their logos. We will we'll see a few different uh, uh, models that help us understand situational awareness. They all remind us of our recycling models because they all are cyclical. They never really end. It starts with awareness, then assessment, then action, then evaluation. And once you've evaluated, your awareness is improved. And once it's improved, you go through the cycle again. And that's what the uh, tools that are available to us help us to understand the essence of situational awareness. I will define it much uh, <laughs> in, a, in a less humorous way than, uh, than uh, Gary Larson did in that uh, Far Side cartoon. I'll explain it the way FEMA explains it and defines it. Um, the uh, it's situ situational awareness is defined as the ability to identify, process, and comprehend the critical information about an incident, knowing what's going on around you, and requiring continuous monitoring of relevant sources of information regarding actual incidents and developing hazards. Um, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to point to that picture on the lower right hand corner. Now I have a video clip from the news of this uh, uh, event. I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to tell you about it because I don't wanna, <laughs> I, I think I'm gonna save some time by not going back and forth to the clips. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this incident. The incident happened in 2015 um, there was an Amtrak derailment. You may remember it. If, if certainly in this area, it was uh, it was uh, a very high-profile news story. It was 
in northern Philadelphia. It was on the uh, notorious Frankfurt Junction where the trains all have to slow down. If you've been on an Amtrak train, you, you, you may remember that. It was this terrible accident that resulted in eight fatalities and hundreds of injuries. And the National Transportation Safety Board did an exhaustive investigation into it. And all of the news reports, including the one you can click on to on this uh, YouTube link when you get a copy of this presentation, um, the NTSB conclusion was that the simple reason that this accident, this terrible, this terrible calamity happened is because of a lack of situational awareness on the part of the engineer. And he was and and he was indicted for this. And it's one of the one of the cases that will lead ultimately to the installation of positive train control on all public railroads. But the report and all of the subsequent analysis focuses on situational awareness and the lack thereof. What was he doing? Right. So you might be thinking, well, he was on his cell phone. He was. Uh, he was he was checking email. He was doing so, he was doing something that he shouldn't have been doing. And of course, if he's not paying full attention to um, to his responsibilities as the engineer of that train, he's doing something that he shouldn't be doing. But he was listening to the radio. There was radio chatter going on among the various trains and the dispatch units. And there, there was another accident, a minor accident, not far from there. And he was paying attention to that and thinking, uh, according to his testimony, thinking about what he was going to um, do if they, if they asked him for any guidance or any help. And as a result, he just wasn't paying enough attention and ended up causing that tragic accident. So let's move on and start to think about um, uh, situational awareness uh, at, at, at its fundamental level. So one of the quotes that they pulled out of my article, and I'll just uh, read it to you, they, they put it in one of those blocks that, uh, that highlights the, um, uh, for each page, what they think is the uh, key point. Our forebears, both histor prehistoric and much more contemporary, exercised situational awareness whenever they left their caves, cabins, or co cottages, or they didn't return. Our modern lives do not depend as intrinsically on these survival skills, except in the violent settings noticed above. For the most part, that's a positive development. On the other hand, it means that to obtain situational awareness skills, pilots, um, police officers, <laughs> and even healthcare, healthcare workers and professors need to, be, need to be properly trained and focus on their own situational awareness on a regular basis. So there are tools that are available to us. One of the most famous uh, uh, books that I like to use in my classes and uh, remind people that situational awareness is not new is Sun Tzu's The Art of War. In it, he has a number of examples where he, where he instructs his generals um, in the essential um, aspects of situational awareness. You can't be a general or a leader in any um, uh, enterprise without focusing on the fundamental issues of knowing where you are, knowing what's going on around you, and knowing how to respond to it in an effective way. So the tools that we have, the more modern tools, and one of the most uh, popular tools that's used is the, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, got, it's got a funny acronym, it's called the OODA loop. It was developed by Colonel John Boyd, um, an Air Force combat pilot for training purposes. And it is reminiscent of the, of the um, uh, uh, cycle that we saw in the last uh, slide, orient, uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. And of course, after you act, observe what, the, what, what resulted from that action or reorient yourself, decide if any changes have to be made and act again. Um, one of the things that, um, one of the very interesting studies uh, that, uh, that is related to situational awareness was done by Daniel uh, Kahneman. In fact, he won the Nobel, he won the Nobel Prize for it. And, uh, and he, had a, um, he, he had a partner 
in this, Amos Tversky, and they wrote, uh, or really Amos Tversky died before this was published, but it was, uh, it was published and was uh, very well received. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow. And, and in it, Kahneman argues that in most cases, our brain can attain situational awareness even before we're conscious of a specific hazard. Um, our instincts, such as fight, flight, or freeze, allows us to respond to threats before uh, we're even fully aware that they're upon us. Uh, for those of you who aren't going to read Kahneman's book, because it's, uh, it's uh, certainly an excellent scholarly work, but you might want to read um, Michael Lewis's analysis of the, of the concept. He talks about Kahneman and uh, Tversky and how they, how they developed the research. I, I recommend that it's an interesting read and it will give you a deeper understanding of some of these concepts. That picture in the middle I just threw in because I just wanted to remind you that even though we don't think the way our forebearers think, uh, this is a picture of Nairobi, a major African urban center, and a field outside of the, just, just on the other side of those skyscrapers, and a lion um, on the hunt just at the other end of that field. So situational awareness is uh, both modern and uh, ancient, and we still have to worry about some of the issues that we always worried about. Um, getting back to Sun Tzu, I'll quote you uh, one, of, uh, one of my, uh, one of this, one of the quotations that I think reflects his um, uh, focus on situational awareness it says, "The power of estimating the adversary, of controlling the forces of victory, and of shrewdly calculating difficulties, danger, and distances constitutes the test of a great general." Now, uh, situational awareness—probably the the term wasn't used in. In 2,500 years ago by Sun Tzu when he was writing The Art of War, but it's certainly used on a regular basis today in the uh, technological developments that we have to help keep us safer. One of the examples I'll share with you is the uh, New York City Police Department's domain awareness system. You can see a picture of it on the uh, upper right hand corner and the domain awareness system collects and analyzes data from sensors throughout the city. We're talking about 9,000 closed circuit TV cameras, 500 license plate readers, 2 billion plate reads. Right? Um, I don't know if you remember but the terrorist incident in Boston uh, uh, after the uh, uh, the, after the uh, Boston Marathon, another terrible catastrophe, a terror, uh, an outrageous uh, act of terrorism, they, they, the data that they collected that helped them discover who the perpetrators were came from uh, tickets that were issued. Right? Tickets were issued to uh, illegally parked cars in the area of the uh, Boston Marathon, <clears throat> and that's one of the ways that they were able to conduct their investigation and capture uh, or, or figure out who was, who perpetrated uh, that act. There are 600 fixed and mobile radiation and chemical sensors and a whole network of shot spotter audio gunshot detectors covering 24 square miles. <laughs> There are 54 million 911 calls. So if you ever have to call 911, just remember that everything you say is going to be recorded and uh, apparently recorded for posterity. So I also wanted to share with you something else that the police department does with all this information. Uh, and it's relevant to your work and to mine. They have uh, periodic meetings uh, of an organization called the New York City Police Shield, where they invite private sector and public sector partners, all the universities uh, in New York City participate. And we come and, we, uh, and, and we're briefed on the latest technology and the latest uh, case studies that the police department is prepared to share. They bring, it, they, they bring information from New York City cases. They also bring in uh, guests from the federal government, from other jurisdictions, and it helps raise the situational awareness of all of us who are in this 
um, uh, in this field in a professional way, but they're also useful for us to share with everybody just to raise the awareness of, uh, uh, of everybody and make sure that uh, all of the students and faculty members that I have to deal with to make sure that everyone is um, just a little bit ahead of the curve. And so how do we maintain situational awareness? I have something up here on the right. I'm, I, once again, in the essence of time, I'm going to skip the, uh, uh, the video clip, but I encourage you to take a look at it. It's a short clip, um, and, uh, and I think it'll be very helpful for you, but I'll summarize it for you. It's the Cooper color code system. Y y you're, wondering, you're wondering where, uh, uh, where where this concept of white, yellow, orange, red, it's a military, uh, it, it, its origins are in the military and it was designed by an officer, uh, a training officer uh, named, uh, named Cooper. That's the, um, that's the, uh, uh, that's the uh, background of the Cooper color code system, but I'll tell you what it is. It means that we can use these colors to tell us what stage of situational awareness we are in. And most of us, Cooper tells us that 90% of us, 90% of the time are in the white zone. That means we're relaxed, we're completely unaware, we're walking down the street. I would say it's much, it's even worse than when he put this together because today if I'm on the subway, I see everybody with, um, with their earbuds in their ears, everybody is listening to something or watching something on their cell phones. Uh, people are walking down the street oblivious to what's going on around them because they're holding their cell phones, listening to listening to music, listening to programs, watching a movie, whatever whatever it is that they're doing. We are all in the white zone. We are relaxed and completely unaware, and I and I'm guessing that that's a blessing. What Cooper tells us is that. If we're going to be situationally aware, we have to ratchet up just a little bit. We have to be relaxed, but aware. Um, in, the, uh, in his training, and it's used in uh, many police departments and law enforcement in general, if you're carrying a firearm, the expectation is that yellow is going to be the minimum acceptable level that you're going to be engaging in. Right? You're always paying attention to what's going on around you. If you're in the orange zone, that means that you've already uh, identified a potential threat and you are deciding what to do about it and whether, there, wh whether you need to take action. And in the red zone, you verify the threat and you're executing the necessary response. If you think back, it relates directly to the cycles that we've discussed, especially the OODA loop. So my, uh, if there's only one takeaway that you get from this webinar, it's to try to move yourself out of the white zone and into the yellow zone. Be more aware of what's going on around you. It doesn't mean that you're going to be expecting uh, danger all the time. It doesn't mean that you're going to be anxious all the time. It just means that you should try to train yourself to be a little more aware. The rest of the um, discussion that we'll have this morning will be, uh, I'd like to go over a few cases uh, from, uh, fr from my experience as the, uh, as the University Director of Environmental Health, Safety, and Risk Management at the City University of New York. City University of New York, as uh, Colleen told us, is a very big system. It's the largest uh, urban university uh, system in the, uh, in the country. And uh, if you include faculty, staff, and uh, students, part-time, full-time, uh, uh, professional studies, general studies, we're talking about a population that is, uh, regardless of how you want to do the count, it's definitely over a half a million people. And so it's, and we have, uh, and we have 25 uh, campuses. There's a campus map, uh, a stylized one on the upper left-hand corner. All of our campuses are within uh, New York City, uh, but they are all in different parts of the city. As you can see from these pictures, some of them are in suburban settings and have modern new buildings like, uh, uh, like the Holocaust Center that you see on the lower left-hand corner at Queensborough Community College. Some of them are in old converted Manhattan buildings. The one on the upper right is um, 
is the is the CUNY Graduate Center. It is housed in the old B. Altman's department store. And uh, in, in fact, just a tip for all of you, uh, some of the filming for uh, uh, the popular TV program, Miss Maisel, Mrs. Maisel, uh, were filmed in the uh, in the Graduate Center and some of the old. Uh, around some of the old staircases and elevators that were uh, originally part of B. Altman's. So when you're, when you're thinking about it, these campuses are very different and have very different uh, uh, risk management responsibilities and situational awareness concerns. The Graduate Center is on 34th Street and 5th Avenue. It's right in the center of everything. And then you have uh, more traditional looking campuses like Lehman College in the lower right, which is which looks like it could be in New England. And, uh, and, and so the fact that all of our campuses are in different locations and have different uh, uh, campus features means that we have to um, incorporate those distinctions and differences in our uh, risk management thinking. Let me go through a few cases. The first case I'll share with you is fire. Um, and uh, the title I have for this case is Fire Situational Awareness and Incident Command. Uh, what you see on the upper right hand corner is uh, obvious to everyone. It's a New York City uh, fire engine with another one uh, creeping right behind it, getting through traffic and, uh, and, and responding, to a, responding to a call. Fire is what we refer to in risk mapping as a five by five hazard. It's high probability, and high consequence, right? It's not, uh, it, it, it's, there are very few television programs that are going to be made about firefighting. Of course, that's, you know, there are a couple of good movies and TV shows about it. But in most cases, fires happen on a, unfortunately, regular basis. They're relatively common and they have uh, extraordinarily bad consequences. And so when, when we have an incident, thankfully they're, they're pretty uh, infrequent at our CUNY schools, but every now and then there is a fire. And I typically will go out to, to make sure that I could be helpful. And the way to do that, uh, to be helpful, is to figure out, is to do your own situational awareness and figure out how you can be helpful, where you can fit in. And when I get to a, when I get to a fire and there are dozens of firefighters in their bunker gear, uh, running around in a very dangerous situation, I know that I need to stay out of their way and make sure that they can do what they need to do without me interrupting them. The first thing I'll do is I'll go find the incident commanders. And how do I find them? I go look for that status board. It's usually on an easel or on a, uh, or on a pop-up desk near one of the fire engines. And, it, and the picture on the lower right is um, is a, a New York Fire Department status board. It tells the commanders where everyone is. It shows where they're going. It gives them the, an update on the status of the fire, on the ventilation, on the uh, number of uh, on, on the number of people, on anything else that they need to know to help them figure out how to address the fire as quickly as possible. Now, where do I come in? So they have their own tools for situational awareness, but I let them know that I can provide them with information that they also will need to put up on that board. For example, are there hazardous chemicals in any of the buildings that they'll be entering? For example, what's the status of the, um, uh, of the uh, fire safety personnel? Uh, what can the public safety officers help them get access to rather than forcing them to break down doors if there's no imminent threat perhaps we could just get them the keys to some areas and help them in there so when 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 we try to figure out the situation uh the situational awareness components of a fire we go to the we go to the uh, source of all of this information and then we then it trickles down to help us figure out how to maximize the effectiveness of the response and hopefully minimize the damage done. Another case study would be lab safety. We have probably by now about cl close to 1700 labs throughout the, uh, throughout the CUNY system. And you could see that every now and then something bad happens in a lab. Those two pictures on the, uh, on the upper right, uh, on, on the upper right and the lower right are two pictures of one of a lab bench that, uh, 
had a small incident on it and had a small explosion. You could see the result. The result is not catastrophic, but nonetheless, it could have been. And it certainly people could have been hurt by flying glass, by any, uh, by, by, by any of the other uh, issues that, uh, that, that, that resulted from that small explosion. On the lower one, you see that the fire was contained to a fume hood, but you see it was bad enough that it uh, required a response by the fire department. You see his shoulder and arm um, on the right side of that photo. Uh, both of these, both of these came, resulted from um, electrical shorts. And one of the things that I do to help motivate, uh, motivate everyone who works in our uh, uh, environmental health and safety team and to help all of the, all of the people working in our labs to be more situationally aware is that little tool you see in the, um, uh, on the bottom of the uh, uh, slide. It's a picture of a uh, multi-purpose tool and one of the purposes or one of the tools in it, you could see it from here, is a wire cutters. And we gave these out to our EHS officers one Christmas and we suggested that they carry it with them whenever they go visit a lab. And if they see a um, frayed wire, rather than give somebody an opportunity to say, well, budgets are tight, I'm going to figure out how to tape this up and, uh, and, and, and reuse it and save a few dollars, uh, we tell them, that's penny wise and fat pound foolish. And just to uh, discourage them from doing it, we take out our tool, we give it a quick clip in a few places, and then they don't have a choice but to buy uh, a new wire for it. We also make sure that no one works alone in a lab without a pr proper authorization and training. If they don't have a C14 certificate of fitness from the fire department, they shouldn't be working alone in a lab. And last but not least, we're constantly inspecting and auditing our labs to make sure that they are safe. A third case study is in a, a little different tack I'll take, it's, it's international travel. We, we have students, as do all universities, um, we have students who are traveling all over the globe because it's part of their educational experience. We think it's great. If you're going to be a global university, you have to, you have, to have students coming to your campus from all over the world, and you have to have your own students uh, traveling around the world for, for, for educational growth and to understand other cultures. And, and, and uh, just as an example, we have, we have students uh, going back and forth to Puerto Rico to uh, help the, the entire island recover from the uh, devastation of Hurricane Maria. It's a great thing for our students, and hopefully it's a great thing for the, uh, for the residents of Puerto Rico. That's one example. Our students go all over the world, and we have to make sure that they are aware of their surroundings when they're traveling because while it is edifying and a terrific uh, educational growth experience, it's also very hazardous. And, the, and, and students uh, will often think that because they're going on a sanctioned uh, university program, they don't have to worry quite as much. And we try to remind them that situational awareness is even that much more important when you're, when you're traveling. We have uh, on the upper right hand corner is just the picture of the cover page of our uh, CUNY International Travel Guidelines. We don't let you go anywhere if you haven't reviewed the State Department um, guide for travel to whatever location you're heading to. Because the State Department does an excellent job of evaluating the hazards of different travel locations and it's every uh, iteration of their program gets better and better because they drill down not only to uh, countries at large, but also to specific locations within regions within those countries. And if you're going somewhere where there is a, uh, um, a State Department uh, alert or a State Department warning, you have to go through a waiver process to make sure that it's acceptable for you to go there and you have to take appropriate precautions. Um, uh, if you do get if you do get approval to travel, and once you're there, you have to continuously track any changes to the State Department notifications. I'll just share one quick story with you. The picture on the lower right is a picture of Cairo's Tahrir Square at the height of the protests 
and demonstrations uh, of the Arab Spring. And we had a student who was uh, doing research in one of those buildings around the square. And um, didn't, uh, and, and her situational awareness evolved just as mine did a little bit slower than one might have hoped. Uh, in my situational awareness at, uh, at the World Trade Center, hers in, in estimating the impact of, those cr of that crowd. We ended up having to call in our insurance uh, carrier um, and she uh, ended up being evacuated from uh, Tahrir Square. Thankfully, everything went well and it was a, a, a good lesson for all of us and one with, uh, uh, thankfully, without, uh, w without a sad story at the end of it. The last one I'll share with you is, um, is weather, severe storms, and this is just uh, an example of uh, what happened at, during Hurricane Sandy. Those of you who remember it, I, I think we, we all remember it as a terrible storm. We had blackouts, we had, uh, uh, we had gas shortages. We, it was just uncomfortable for everybody in the region, but for those of us who were responsible for or participating in coastal storm planning and figuring out how the city should respond and for a, a huge system like the City University of New York, how we should respond, it was quite a daunting challenge. Because as you could see, the way we prepare is through those maps and the coastal storm plan, like the one you see in the center of all of those photos, that's called the slosh map, where we see what the uh, potential of a storm might be and how many people have to be evacuated potentially, where we're going to take them, what shelters we're going to set up. CUNY ran 10 of the 65 city shelters, so we were highly attuned to this. Um, in addition, the subway system shut down, so it was as if you were preparing for a transit strike. You have, uh, you have no subway service. Uh, you see what happened to some of the subway stations. Some are still being rebuilt and 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 the big item in the news is the l train tunnel between manhattan and brooklyn that was so severely damaged in uh, hurricane sandy that there is uh, that they were going to shut down the whole system we'll see hopefully the uh, the revised plan will uh, help us figure out how to do it without closing down the entire system there was also it, it was also a snowstorm in the middle of Hurricane Sandy, there was a blackout. There was a, a a gas shortage. All of these things are like injects in a um, in an exercise for situational awareness and risk management. So let me go back to our original story and conclude with this and take a question or two. Um, uh, the story started with uh, with a police officer on a path station at the bottom of of. Uh, of um, uh, the World Trade Center, and it ends uh, with, a, with, with some police officer in Jersey City. And I will tell you that this is the upper right-hand corner. Uh, the upper right-hand corner picture is what Lower Manhattan looked like. After I left my building, after I, I was working at the time at uh, 60 Broad Street, uh, made sure everybody who was working with us um, was safe, stayed there for a while and answered phone calls to, from, from, from husbands and wives and uh, people who were concerned. And thankfully I was able to tell them that their spouse was safe and that they're gonna make their way home somehow. I also made my way home somehow. I walked through that mess over there. Of course it was much safer by the time I walked through. And I hitched a ride on one of these tugboats. I don't recommend it as a, uh, as a, uh, as a, a commuting method, but it certainly uh, got me across the, uh, across the river and, uh, and left me with, a, with an interesting story to tell about how I got out of Manhattan. But, uh, but what I really wanted to tell you about was this police officer in Jersey City. When I got to Jersey City, um, there were a lot of people waiting for uh, evacuees from New York on that, on that day. And there was one police officer who was standing on the, uh, on the uh, hood of this Jersey City police car. Not, not this one, but it looked like this one. It was, a, it was also a, 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 um, a, a, an old uh, Crown Vic. And, uh, and he was standing there and he also had no idea what to tell people. 
and everybody came by. There were hundreds, thousands of people who came by who did, had no idea what trains were running, what buses were running, how they'd get back to their cars, how they'd get back to their homes. And he was standing there and answering these questions over and over and over and over again. And never stopped smiling. And never got testy. And that's because he had situational awareness. Now, of course, he was trained to have it, but he exhibited it and exercised it a thousand times over. I was so amazed. I wish I had taken down his name. And I hope that he and all of his, um, and all of the other officers that I ran into that, uh, that day, I hope they're all uh, uh, either very senior commanders somewhere or more likely quietly retired and surrounded by their grandchildren somewhere. I hope, they, I hope they're all well, but I learned from them the importance of situational awareness, not just in developing risk management programs, but in understanding that that little, that little uh, tagline that we all think of and don't really pay much attention to, if you see something, say something. The only way you're really going to see something is if you keep your eyes and ears open like that, uh, like that ad that the Port Authority has, that the PATH system has, with the police officer well-trained and well-armed, and the regular citizen, like all the rest of us, who all he has is his eyes and his ears and his cell phone to do something with. And so that's what I, that, that's the takeaway lesson. Stay aware, be situationally aware, try not to be in the white zone all the time. Try to maintain a sense of your surroundings, what's going on. It will help you at work. It will help you in your, in, in your day-to-day activities. And it's also the essence of risk management. I want to thank you for listening. Um, this is a picture. This is, uh, of course, me. Uh, my and uh, my address at CUNY, uh, my contact information if anybody would like to get a hold of me, a copy of the front page of this uh, article, Situational Awareness, the Essence of Risk Management, and published by Ermia in the, in the Ermia Journal uh, last August. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions if you have any. Howard, thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderful. And again, our apologies to all for some initial uh, technical difficulties. We do have uh, a two-part question here. Um, the first part is, overall, do you think that the general population's situational awareness has improved or declined since 2001? And the second part is, what do you think is the biggest challenge or threat to situational awareness now in 2019? Um, so the... the um, the answer to the first half of the question, but by the way, it's a, uh, a terrific question. The answer to the first half is that, yes, I do think that we, that our situational awareness in general has improved because for better or worse, 9-11 gave us a wake-up call and it reminded us that uh, bad things can happen, bad things do happen. And while we have the greatest uh, uh, public servants looking out for us in the police departments and in the fire departments, ultimately we're all responsible for our own safety and our own well being. And I think that's the lesson that we learned. We learned, really learned it the hard way but I think it has helped us and I think it does make us more aware and it, it helps us keep uh, situational awareness um, at the forefront of most of the things that we do. The second uh, part of the question is what, uh, um, what are some of the, some of the issues that uh, prevent us from uh, our situational, I, meant, I mentioned a few of them. I think, uh, I, think th I, I don't mean to minimize the great value of, of technological advancements. They're fantastic. Um, and they help us in every facet of life. Uh, but our 24-7 uh, commitment to um, social media and to our cell phones and to uh, uh, our communication devices uh, often uh, 
uh, often puts us in a position where we're not paying attention to the world around us. And I think we probably need to strike a, a, a better balance if that's, if that's possible. Great, thank you very, very much. Uh, that is the last question. Um, again, well, thank you all for joining us today. Dr. Epson, thank you as always for another wonderful presentation. Uh, I will be sending out an evaluation to everyone. Aside from our technical issues, I, I trust you all found this to be a valuable program. Thank you so much and have a great day, everyone. Thanks very much.